This is a very special video because in this particular uh, video log I don't have anything to talk about. Sorry, what's that? I'm just talking to some of my invisible friends. Let's see, the world is pretty much the way it was yesterday. Same world. Same shit, different channel. Hmm, I life. What are we going to do? People, I'm asking you, what are we going to do about life? What are you going to do about it? One of my few viewers, what, what have you done to make my life an easier place? Did you give my father a partial lobotomy? Did you double wrap my father's dick on the night he conceived me? No. Mm. I discovered this new uh, kombucha company. They're all right. It was a very refreshing uh, spearmint citrus uh, kombucha here on the uh, west coast. This was made in Powell River, BC. What does it say? Inspiring living alchemy. I like that. And they uh, they put crystals in it. So, I don't know. I think it's made me feel a bit better. I'm I'm um thinking after doing the ceremony at the Newcastle Island, the ceremony for the, the, sol the solar plexus yesterday, that the vagus nerve issues that I have are related to the solar plexus. And uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot going on in that part of the body. A lot of nerves connect and can come to determine a lot of how we behave and, and how we think. So. Basically, I, it's a wait and see right now with the different uh, rituals that I've done. But if anything, I I feel a little a little more lighthearted. I, maybe that's why I have nothing to say because I've been spending months and months and months talking about everything I hate and psychopaths and um, just being filled with the purulent and and septic uh, experience that I've had of the world, and also feeling quite morbid on the death of one of my uncles. I just, I don't know if anyone's ever gotten morbid, but I just, the idea of dying insults me. I, uh, I've been sick a lot in my life and, and uh, around the solar plexus. And when you're sick around the solar plexus, and it doesn't sound, it sounds like an unpleasant term to say you're sick around this, but, but that's what it is, is it makes you a bit morbid because the solar plexus is a life-death area of the body. It's a gateway. So, uh, it, it can feel like it's taking the life out of you a little bit. Like you have sort of like a, a life-eating disease down in your gut. You know, if anyone who's ever had gut issues, you know, it takes the, it takes a lot of strength, a lot of, you know, out of you. And, um, healing that has been, uh, a really huge imperative of my life. And in fact, uh, in the last week, I've done two different ceremonies. 
uh, for healing the heart and the solar plexus on two separate islands, actually, and felt uh, and saw uh, and experienced a lot of confirmation of what I was doing. <coughs> and that uh, the ancestral spirits are listening. So, as a result, I don't, I don't have as much to talk about because <coughs> I don't know what to say. I, uh, I want to pursue life. I want to pursue health. Um, I don't know where I'm going to live in the next year. I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but it's it, as it rounds as the, I can tell you this, that this year is going to tell a story. So we're, we're moving through April, May. The sun is going to reach its highest point on June 20th to 22nd. Um, this year is going to be a dramatic telling of my life. And yes, I, the year is is something that can speak to just me and just my life, as it can speak to yours and your life. To me, this year is a dramatic retelling of my life, of coming out of a very cold, septic winter, and I'm just going to make as much use of that fire in the sky as I possibly can. I've been doing more sun gazing. I no longer wait morning and evening. I'll do it during the day. I'll stare at the sun, and sure enough, my eyesight is just fine. So. Sometimes if you blink or whatever, it helps, but uh, I'll stare at the sun any chance I get. Uh, I, I'm very creative with everything I do, so I might move behind a tree or a stone, and just wherever you find yourself, well, you don't have to do it, but you know, you, you do take, I will say that if someone decides they're going to start staring at the sun, you, you do that at your own risk. You know, I'm not going to start telling people to go stare at the sun. I'm not a fucking ophthalmologist. I don't know what that's going to do to you, but... Um, that's what I'm experimenting with, and uh, it's it's odd to me that we're told our whole lives not to look at the sun. I mean, it's one of the most central pieces of our lives is the sun. You ever just wandered? Uh, I get to wander in country, little forests and stuff, and I, I want to see a lot more in my life. And you just you ever wonder like what what life would be without the sun? I don't mean like if the sun didn't exist. I mean if you couldn't see the sun. Uh, I live in Canada, and Canada earns its reputation. On the west coast of British Columbia, we have some of the lowest amount of sunlight hours anywhere in North America. Um, so we in, we endure without a lot of sun. I, we need to uh, we need to get as much sun as we can. I've been out in the sun a lot. Most people I know work for a living. They're hardly ever outside. Uh, I don't know what they do. I guess maybe they have an easier time of it than I do. I don't know. So this year I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to be willing to to reconsider where my life can go because part of healing the solar plexus is, is is starting to make plans of what to do with a healthy solar plexus. If my solar plexus became healthy, if my line my mind can undergo the type of growth, which is what it is, growth and restoration are the same thing. If my mind can undergo, my mind and my nervous system can undergo the kind of growth that I've been working on for many years, stepping back into the different layers of trauma that my body has endured. And if you've watched my videos, and I commend you if you have, and uh, it's perfectly fine if you haven't, you've seen a lot of negativity pour out of me. And by the negativity, by the way, I don't mean it's a bad thing. I mean, it's been very useful to me, and I've learned a lot from it. Um, somewhere in in all of the uh, the pus of my emotional body is uh, information and nourishment and blood that I need very much. So, nothing wrong with howling at the moon. I highly recommend it. You know, using your voice. I always recommend that. It's a, it's a very safe thing to recommend. Always, you know, and there are many situations you can be in where you can't use your voice. And the worst part of that is learning not to use it. And then, Maybe even, you know, uh, encouraging other people not to use it. Oh, oh, I try to work in the voice as much as I can. And in my dealings with other people, um, I find I'm becoming much more forthcoming about many type of things about my life that I just don't feel the need to conceal as much, which is uh, my low amount of sexual activity, for instance. It's become not uncommon for me to tell men that I haven't, that I've been basically abstinent or celibate. I don't know. I think one of them means 
What's the difference between abstinent and celibate? I think abstinent means you don't have sex with other people, and celibate means you don't use the sexual energy at all. I don't know. I'm not sure. One of them probably means you can have sex with children. I don't know, it's probably a Catholic thing. Um, for over 10 years, for me, and uh, it doesn't really concern me. Luckily, I think I'm in probably a smaller percentage, thank, thank God, of men that don't really need to use the sexual function that much, but uh, or have sex with women that much. Um, I don't claim that's a healthy thing. It's not something I walk around with a proud little gold star saying, look at me, I haven't meddled with any of your daughters for a decade. You should, you should, you should think I'm a really wonderful guy. Um, but um, I've just been really focusing on uh, what I would like from anybody, which is the ability to talk and uh, to not have to rush into anything, you know, ever or ever again at all um, is a wonderful thing for me and, and to, to understand that you have to kind of appreciate a little bit about the kind of person that I am and we're all different, we're all different sexually even as heterosexuals and uh, to me uh, there's got to be someone who shares my philosophical outlook on life and a gentleman yesterday said to me well, what is your philosophical outlook and I had to put it really simply for a, a narcissistic type person I don't completely dislike him, he just has a lot of trouble listening. He's actually even told me. One of the first narcissists who told me they have a bit of brain damage and they have trouble listening to people. So I have to kind of wedge it in there. So I thought, well, I have whenever maybe five and a half seconds to tell him my philosophy of life. So I said, question everything. Nothing is sacred. Ideas should not be protected from scrutiny. I, I love skepticism of everything and anything because it always puts us, I think, in the best possible position. Skepticism doesn't mean you're telling other people that they have to be wrong. Skepticism says, Let's be clear here about how confident we are in anything that we know. And as human beings, when we know each other, we always come across beliefs that we just don't want to question. And that's fair enough in itself because you always I have my own personal beliefs that I wouldn't want someone getting in my face about every single day. And there's a time and a place for everything. Nothing is so evil that it's out of place or out of time. You know, there's a right time maybe for things. And, and maybe... Uh, uh, at the same time, if someone questions your beliefs, it may not be that someone's contradicting your beliefs, it's how they question them. Are they attempting to arbitrate for what they should be? So if you get someone who says, you know, I don't believe in Jesus, which is good, because I don't believe in Jesus, uh, or you can get someone who says, look, you should believe in, in Garuda or something, and shove, uh, shove a different kind of belief down their throat. And uh, that's not, uh, I'm not giving a very good example, actually. People can be too forceful sometimes, you know, unreasonable. And uh, lo and behold, where do we become most unreasonable? When we're emotional. shouldn't necessarily be that way. I don't want to make the argument that emotions should necessarily lead to lapses in reasoning capacity, but they often do until they're brought into alignment. Isn't it great? I mean, what would you do in your life? What would any of us do if we couldn't be unreasonably and irrationally emotional when we needed to, within reason? And then you can bring the emotional experience, mental capacity, which is very quick. Uh, and this mental capacity, I want to relate to the element or the spirits of air, the spirits of electricity, very quick. Right? Our body does a lot of things very quick, and we can think, I know I do, very quickly. Or our blood moves very quickly through our body, and I can speak on behalf of my blood as it moves through my body. You're... You're listening, you're listening to blood talk. This is hemoglobin. You know, this is Iron Man, iron in him, my, my blood. Because it's, there's a magnetic and electrical communication. I'm communication on behalf of nature. You are communication on behalf of nature. And there's a lot to be learned about nature. You know, you don't go into the forest not aware of the predators that might live there. And everywhere you are, you're immersed in nature. And we all know, just keeping it stupid simple, that you're not completely safe in nature any, any time. Right? You can die at any time in nature. There's nowhere in the world you're safe from dying. Right? People can kill you. There was a, a guy, uh, he went to somewhere in South America or Bolivia or something. 
think that's in South America. And, uh, and the, the native population there thought that he'd killed their shaman and they tied, tied a, neck, a noose around his neck. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's awful. And they dragged him through the street until he was dead. I read that in the newspaper today. It just, it just bothered me. And it reminded me how no matter how careful you are, you should be traveling in a country and a bunch of people can put a, a rope around your neck and drag you through the street until you're dead, accusing you of killing someone. You know, basically attacking your dignity, your character, and then killing you. That's close to what my family attempted to do to me. So, there's something to be said for learning about the nature that we in. To learn about society the way society teaches you is not to prepare you for all of the dangers that lay in society. And I think that could be a good way to sum up all of my work. The way society teaches you and the way it talks to you and the way it tries to get you to talk and think a certain way doesn't prepare you for all the dangers that you might face. Nothing ever will, but I don't think that's the best way to do it. And we talk really quickly and the, the idea of the air and the clouds and, and it takes a very quick and imaginative mind to build a canopy for your life, right? to build the north of your life, your north pole over yourself and the world does that for you right people are so dead in that part of the mind that you can have chemtrails in the sky right and they don't even know they're there because that's part of our mind right and the sun what if the sun comes through our mind the sun is right up here above us and it comes down through us we're solar beings we need that light and it has all different qualities that work through the different seasons of the year different lenses if you will different uh different densities. You'll notice at night the air is a different density, sound travels more at night, sound travels more, uh, sometimes it's dampened I think when there's a heavy snowfall. You see how sound and things change. That's because there's elect electrical medium has changed. The ether has actually changed in some sense in how it's interacting with uh, different forms of the ether, different forms of electricity. I would say everything's formed from electricity. Uh, I wish we had a better name for electricity than electricity because I don't like using the word L. Life force might be a better way to put it. But you see in the religions how the atmosphere, the atmosphere of man is polluted and populated, the horizon of the mind, as we reach out, right, into the abstract faculties, and we attempt to account for what we do not know, and to draw sustenance, though mother's milk, from the vast reaches of our mind and experience. This horizon has been populated with stories of torture, stories of special enlightenment, like special relativity. Um, that set frames of reference for billions of people living their lives who then just go, oh, okay, I don't... And the more it does that, the harder it is to think. Because if you haven't been thinking your whole life and you've got this thing on top of you, this firmament, this, this skull cap of society, and you start thinking, it's very stressful. It's like, why would an astronaut take off their helmet? But that's, in a sense, what you have to do to take off the helmet that's been put on the cock of your head so that you can experience the sort of seminal exchanges with the etheric fields of intelligence around you. Another way of saying, get out in nature. So there's, there are different uh, ephemeral type of systems and long logic and sequences that are happening in my life as I perform ceremony and watch the results and for the first time in my life and this is where I'll finish this video I've gotten rid of almost all religion in doing that so I'm literally it's just between me and nature as far as uh, major uh, my, my vocabulary of what what's happening to my system what's happening to my body and what I'm doing and uh, waiting to see the results and basically building a new way of looking at life I don't know that's it that's what that's what video logs are for. I, I just give you a little bit of my business, and uh, I know this video isn't um, as 
rousing as maybe some of them I make, but then again, when you have as few of you as the video as I do, you are relieved of the great burden that it would be to attempt to entertain my fellow human beings, because of course there are many things to entertain you in the world, so I don't need to fill that particular gap. Thanks for listening.